good morning. Welcome to Javel Prez. If you would, grab your Bibles. Let's remain standing if you're able. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, grab one of these blue hardback Bibles. They're all throughout the room. It's page 1196. We are into Hebrews chapter 12 this morning. I'd love for everybody to have a copy of God's Word out in front of them. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 3 through 11, page 1,196. If you don't have a Bible at home, take one of these Bibles as our Christmas gift to you. And uh, if it's been a while since you've been back at church, welcome. Church is better with you here. Uh, we've missed you. Welcome back. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 3, verses 3 through 11 this morning. Grab a copy of God's Word and hear what the Lord has to say to us in His holy and inerrant Word. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives." It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father doesn't discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever. This is the word of the Lord. And then would you be seated and keep your Bible and your heart open as we pray. Uh, Father, you know each one of us. Uh, you know our hardships. You know our sufferings. And so, Father, we ask that you would give us ears to hear how you are reaching towards us even in the midst of our sufferings. And, Lord, would we hear your voice and nothing else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's do a thought experiment. Uh, I've been hanging out at the historic church a lot lately. I'm excited about some things we're doing over there. And the 1800s have been on my mind quite a bit because that building dates to the 1800s. Uh, let's do a thought experiment, though, for just a second. How would you explain to someone from the 1800s what the Internet is? Let's, you know, it's a thought experiment. So imagine someone could time travel from the 1800s of Jacksonville, and then you pulled out your iPhone. And you had to explain to them what the internet is. You would say, uh, it's limitless information. And they'd say, oh, great, so it's like a library. And you would say, no, not like a library. It's not in a place. And they'd say, oh, so like the government controls it? And you'd be like, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, kind of, no, but I don't think so. And they'd say, well, who controls it? I don't really, I don't really know. I don't really know who it is. So it gets a lot of things wrong. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it does. But not like, not like my bank account, you know. Uh, GPS works pretty well. Oh, wh where is this information stored? I don't really know. I don't know where it's stored. Um, is it like just, is it a physical thing? Well, you need a little device to get to it. But it can give you all of the right information at all the right time immediately right now. So it's like in the air? Uh, no, it's like in a satellite which I think is like a big metal thing flying around our planet. Okay, so like one person can use it at, at a time, right? No, 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 like, I don't know, like billions. Like we're all doing it, like all the time. Oh, and by the way, I'm like never disconnected. I'm probably thinking about the internet or dependent on the internet like all hours of my waking life. <laughs> the reason I, I share that with you is uh, it's a fun thought experiment to think about because, you know, if you think about your cell phone for just a second, you can take your cell phone out for just a second if you want, if you need to. Uh, look down at your cell phone. Do you know how that thing works? Do you know why it works? You know, I'm reminded of uh, an advertisement I saw a couple years ago. Uh, the, the actress Anna Kendrick uh, was doing an advertisement for Domino's Pizza, and she got real philosophical for a Domino's Pizza commercial because she said, what's crazy is if I touch my phone in the right places, a pizza appears at my door. 
It's pretty philosophical for a Domino's ad. I guess what I'm getting at is you are utterly dependent upon the internet for like almost everything, yet you have no idea how it works, why it does what it does, but you do know how to use it for some pretty cool things. What I want to suggest to you is when you look down at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through 11, our passage this morning, is that it's actually about going through hardship and going through difficulty in life. It's all about how do you and I experience suffering. And it may frustrate you, but the author does not try to explain why God does what he does or how suffering enters into a world that was made by a good God. Instead of explaining how and why, what this passage does is it teaches you how to experience suffering, how to use it <laughs> in your life. And so as long as you can you know, look down at your cell phone and say, I don't need to know how this works, I just need to know how to use it, that's how I need you to experience this passage on suffering. You don't need to know why it's happening to you. Uh, you don't need to understand the ins and outs of suffering. You need to know how to respond to it and how you can use it in your life to actually produce a life that matters. So let's look down at suffering and hardship, especially from the Christian perspective. Look down at verse 3. Right, so this whole passage, he's talking to people who are going through suffering and difficulty and hardship. And he's talking to them. He says, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Who's he talking about right now? Well, he's talking about the Son of God, the, the God that became a man, right? That was born into our world, who died for our sins. And what he tells us in the midst of our suffering first is to think about Jesus, Consider Jesus, who himself endured hardship from, from sinners, who went through such hostility against himself. And what does he want you and I to do? He says, you and I are called not to grow weary or faint-hearted in the midst of our suffering. And then he says, in your struggle against sin, you haven't resisted to the point of shedding your blood. <laughs> and so what is his point there? Is he saying, well, don't complain too much about your suffering because you haven't died yet. <laughs> Uh, maybe he's making a joke about that, but I think really what he's trying to focus our attention on is the one who did shed his blood, the one who did really suffer, who really did give up his life. And so the first step as a Christian when we go through suffering is to sort of reorient our hearts closer to the heart of Jesus. Consider Jesus, friend, who himself knows intimately what it's like to go through disappointment, rejection, isolation, hostility from people, who knows what it's like to actually shed his blood. See, the Christian perspective of suffering is always Jesus-oriented. This theme is all throughout the book of Hebrews. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, the author of Hebrews says this, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, Jesus is God, and God became a man, and it was fitting that he, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of our salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus was made perfect through suffering. And why did Jesus suffer in this life? Well, Hebrews 2.18 says this, For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus suffered so that you and I could appeal to him for help. You know, when you think about your suffering or your hardship, it's always fascinating talking to people because everybody has their own path. Everybody's suffering is different. It's not a competition, and it's good to remind ourselves of that. Uh, but as Christians, when you and I go through hardship and difficulty, our first move is to reorient ourselves to the person of Jesus Christ who suffered so that he could help us. You know, I'm reminded of what C.S. Lewis, that great author and Christian writer, uh, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, had a lot of suffering in his life. Uh, in the uh, problem of pain, he said this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So what are you going through right now? 
Uh, what are the things that are still nagging you? And you don't, it doesn't have to be recently that you're suffering. You know, suffering can chase us for decades, right? Wounds can linger. You don't have to say those things out loud, and every one of us has a different answer to that question. But if you can think about what the hardest thing is you're dealing with, maybe it's a divorce, maybe it's the rejection, maybe it's the breakdown of a relationship, the loss of a job, whatever it is, a health problem, whatever you have, listen to these words as if God himself is speaking to you. Beloved son and daughter, in your pain, consider Jesus who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. And remember that he shed his blood for you. So don't get weary. Don't give up. Uh, what I want to suggest to you is that uh, the way that you and I use suffering, right? The way that you use your cell phone without actually understanding everything going on behind it, the way that you use suffering is you have to recognize that what suffering is, is it's sort of like a wormhole that leads you directly to the heart of God. Do you know what a wormhole is? Supposedly, scientists say a wormhole is like, if this is space-time, a wormhole is like when space-time goes like that, you know, so you could time travel, basically, right? Imagine your suffering is a wormhole that immediately transports you to the very heart of God, a heart that loves you, that has suffered for you, that knows what rejection is like, that knows what disappointment is like. Consider Jesus. And then here, the next thing that this passage tells us, look at verse three, we're called to not be weary and not be faint hearted. You know, this language is language of a marathon, right? Uh, so this is language that Greeks would have used for like running a race, right? So you've heard the saying, life is not a sprint, it's a marathon, right? Don't give up. So this is what he's saying. He's saying, recognize that your suffering is meant to lead you to the heart of Jesus. Trust that. Secondly, see your suffering as training for the race of life. Don't give up. The problem is that when you and I experience suffering, you know, if you're anything like, you know, me or a normal human being, when you and I experience suffering, instead of being like, oh, this is a wormhole that leads me directly to the heart of Jesus. I am ready to be sanctified. God, bring it on. If you're like me, that's not how we respond to suffering. Uh, chances are, if you're like a normal human with a normal reaction to things, when you go through hardship, your first response is to go into self-pity, to isolationism, and resentment, right? I think we can all imagine people in our lives who have gone through suffering, and instead of leaning on others, they do what? Their lives become diminished and they go inward. They become resentful. Instead of expanding their hearts and relying on others, they go inward, and their lives become smaller. They become resentful. They dive into self-pity, and they isolate themselves. You know, the poet W.H. Auden wrote a poem called The Age of Anxiety. Great title for the culture you and I live in. And he put it this way, for many of us, we would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the moment and let our illusions die. Uh, Auden wasn't a Christian, but he's tapping into something true, is that when you and I encounter hardship and suffering, many of us would rather just isolate ourselves, become resentful, die in our dread, is how Auden would say it, rather than recognize that this may be our cross to bear, and that the illusion of the life we think we're supposed to leave is really not the life we're supposed to lead. That really what life is about is about drawing closer to the heart of God and knowing Jesus Christ more profoundly than we po thought possible. So, um, you know, I think when we think about suffering, you know, uh, I know it's a heavy topic for Christmas, but for a lot of people, uh, Christmas is a veneer underneath a season of pain because it reminds us of the people who aren't with us anymore. And uh, as I like to say uh, out here, if, you, if you're not, if you haven't heard this from me before, um, I strongly believe that every one of us is, is in either crisis mode or we are in pre-crisis mode. <laughs> Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if this whole idea of suffering and hardship just doesn't make sense, we'll just store this away and put it in your back pocket and give it about 10 years, give or take. 
When he's talking about suffering, though, uh, the big, you know, the, the big beautiful thing in this passage, uh, it, it leads us closer to the heart of Jesus. It teaches us not to give up. It calls us to climb the cross of the moment rather than just giving up and giving over to self-pity. The really beautiful thing that sort of breaks through like the sun through on a cloudy day is this uh, description of God as a loving father. A loving father that loves you and loves us so much that he disciplines us. So when we go through hardship, a Christian response says, apparently, God who absolutely loves me needs to chip away some of my sharper edges. And the thing I think life is about is not actually what my life is supposed to be about. My life is supposed to be about something different. Look down at the end of this passage. I mean, this really gets to the heart of this whole message. Look at verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. <laughs> Duh, <laughs> right? For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But here's the hope, Christian. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What he's saying is that the hope that you and I have through suffering is that somehow through the suffering and difficulties you and I go through, you and I are going to bear fruit, right? That's language for having a life that matters, knowing what really to invest and cultivate in our lives. So that's the hope, is that actually if you see your suffering correctly, you'll actually reorient not just to a closer relationship with God, but to actually to have that your life matters, and you'll give up on the things that don't. But look down with how he, he gets to this idea of this is God the Father's goal for each one of our lives. Now look down at verse 5. Uh, when we go through hardship, the tendency is to isolate and get resentful. And so what does he say? He says, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? And he uses uh, sons not because that we're all sons, but because sons inherit everything. Uh, we're God's children. So when we go through suffering, he's saying, don't forget that God, your Father, loves you, Christian. You are his. And then what does he say? He quotes from the Old Testament. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor grow weary when reproved or corrected by him. For the Lord disciplines the one that he what? Loves. And chastises every son whom he receives. Then he says, We'll just pause right there. What this author has the audacity to tell you is that when you go through hardship and difficulty, God has not stopped loving you. In fact, God is proving his love for you. How does that work? I don't know. I can't even explain the internet to you. How am I going to explain the ins and outs of divinity? I don't know, but I know it works. I know it works. If you go through hardship and difficulty, and you say, I am going to trust God through this. You grow closer to the heart of God. The surprising thing is God shouts at us in our pain. I'm absolutely certain that the moments in your life when things really mattered, they were not easy seasons of life. And I can guarantee you when you were most close to God, it was not when things were going great. It was when God met you in the valley. So Christian, don't regard lightly the hardships of life. God is proving his love for you. Look at verse seven. It is for discipline that you have to endure, right? So he's saying endure because you are being trained. You are being weaned off of the old ways of life and you are being trained, disciplined, so that you will have a life that matters, so that you have a harvest of life. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father doesn't discipline? You know, if God were to leave you without discipline in this life, he would prove that you aren't his child. Besides this, everybody had an earthly dad who disciplined them and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to God the father? <laughs> and then he, he says, okay, okay, if you didn't have a great dad, keep this in mind, right? Look at verse 10, our dads, 
they disciplined us for a short time while we were children as it seemed best to them, <laughs> right? What he's saying is, yeah, every human parent is kind of arbitrary in their punishments. Every human parent fails. Sometimes parents parent out of selfishness. So yes, God is our father, but don't project the bad parents that you've had onto God your father. Here's the difference. God disciplines us. Why? For our good, that we may share his holiness. What the author of Hebrews is teaching you and I to see is that when you and I go through hardship in life, it's so that God can share more of his life with us. And what if that was the great purpose of your life? It was not to strive and get more, get more experiences, more accomplishments. What if the goal of your life was to share life with God? What does Jesus mean when he says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full? You think Jesus is teaching you that you're going to get into Harvard? The cutest boy is going to marry you. It's always going to be wins. The stocks are always going to go up. When Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly, he's talking about the life of God. That God's life would glow brighter and brighter. The strange thing about life that we can't explain is that for some reason, God designed this world so that dark, decomposing, dead soil is the fertile ground through which new life grows. The way you share a life with God is through suffering. Why is that the case? I don't know, but I know that's true. And I know that's the life Jesus lived. You're either in crisis mode or pre-crisis mode. If you're in crisis mode, you know what I'm talking about. If you're in pre-crisis, I might as well be speaking Greek to you. What else are we supposed to see about our suffering? What's this change of perspective? Um, if you look down at verses 7 through 11, there's a lot here. But one thing I want to focus your attention on as you go through a season of suffering and hardship is you have to recognize that you are not alone. No no one else shares exactly what you're going through. No one really gets it. Proverbs says only the heart knows its own remorse. What it, Proverbs is teaching us that no one's actually going to really get it because no one's actually suffering the way you're suffering. But that doesn't mean that you're alone. What it means is just everybody has a different hardship in life they've got to get through. But Christian, you and I are not alone. Look down at verse 7. For what son is there whom the father doesn't discipline? What he means by that is every Christian has a unique development plan of suffering prescribed by the Father. <laughs> so Christian, recognize that you are now in a room of sufferers who all have their unique path through hardship, and we are all together called to grow closer to the heart of Jesus. Now, the great hope that I have, of course, is right there in verse 11, that when you and I go through hardship and suffering, we may not understand why God did it. We may not understand how it works, but you've got to understand how to use it. <laughs> you know, right? You've got to understand how to respond to suffering. See it as an invitation to grow closer to the heart of Jesus. Uh, see it as a reminder that every person that you've ever known has gone through suffering. So you're not alone. And you may be surprised, Christian, if you talk to other Christians about what you're going through, you may be surprised that they actually care and they may actually be there for you. Uh, Parker Palmer, a famous teacher, wrote a lot of books on teaching. A lot of teachers would know who Parker Palmer is. I love this quote. He talks about going through a season of suffering in his 20s. As the darkness began to descend on me in my early 20s, I thought I had developed a unique and terminal case of failure. I did not realize that I had merely embarked on a journey toward joining the human race. <laughs> Everybody's got a path. And the beautiful thing, Christian, is that you and I can lean on each other. And you may be surprised. Suffering brings us closer to the heart of Jesus who suffered for us. That's the message of Christianity. We are sinners and yet God loved us still. <laughs> Wretched as we are, 
Christ died for us so that he could share life with us, so that you could have the life of God shining through you. And not just closer to God, but closer to your brothers and sisters in Christ. For what child of God isn't on this same journey? And of course, I think suffering shows us what our life is supposed to be about. Uh, you know, right there, he says, for, for the moment, all discipline seems painful, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. You know, this image of fruit is about producing something that matters in your life. And uh, really, I think that's what suffering does, is it shows us maybe the things that we live for don't really matter as much as we thought they did. Maybe they were more self-serving than we thought <laughs> was possible. And actually, there's a deeper, more profound way of living that we're called to. But the funny thing is about finding that deeper life is you got to go through the valley to find it. Um, so uh, I can tell you a little bit about my valley, um, if that would be helpful, you know, give you a personal testimony of this. Um, you know, personality tests, have you ever done a personality test? Uh, I've been doing some of those recently. And apparently, my core fear is of being disempowered in my life. And uh, I'm not prone to opening up. So let me open up a little bit and try this. Um, if, you, if you know me at all, you would know that probably the most profound area of suffering in my life, hardship, the thing that I understand why God would do it is he, you know, struck my son with disabilities. I'll never have a conversation with my son. Uh, I don't know if he'll distinguish red from blue. And that's been a theological issue. It's been an emotional issue. And as somebody who doesn't like to open up, it's been really hard to know how to process that. So... Around this time last year, my wife and I went on a family trip to Sun River. Have you ever been there? It's great. You'd love it. And uh, on that way there, um, right before we pile all 16 of our kids into our car, <laughs> um, on, on, on this like desk chest of drawers thing in our living room, um, a book was like glowing. It's like emanating on this shelf. Not really, but you know, metaphorically. And it was a book given to me by Joanne Wilcox. Uh, if you don't know her, she's a beloved older lady at our church. Um, and it was a book she mailed me without any real explanation other than I thought you would like this book. I had sat on it for like six months because it was a book about Adam, you know, Adam and Eve. And I was like, I don't want to read about Adam and Eve. Weird. I don't want to read that book. So I just let it sit on this shelf in my living room for like six months. And then we're about to pile in the car. And then for some reason, I felt like I was supposed to take that book with me. And I pick it up, and it was written about a guy named Henry. And Henry used to teach at Harvard Divinity School, very influential theologian, author. And I pick up this book, and I'm like, I think I'm supposed to take this. Why am I supposed to take this book? And then I open up the front cover, and I'm like, I don't want to read some weird book from the 80s about Adam and Eve. And then it said, Henry Nouwen left Harvard Divinity School to move into a home for adults with disabilities. And he spent the last 12 years of his life caring for a young man named Adam, and then Adam died, and then Henry Nouwen died, and this is their story. And I thought, oh, that's why Joanne mailed me this book. It's not because I need to work on my theology of Adam and Eve. In that book, uh, Caroline and I read, read that book. We cried our way through it. Nouwen writes at one point, though, he draws a parallel between the life of Jesus and the life of this young man who can't speak, can't feed himself, can't use the bathroom. He said, like Jesus... Adam's belovedness, his likeness to God, his mission of peace could be acknowledged only by those who are willing to welcome him as one sent by God. Most people saw Adam as a disabled person who had little to give and who was a burden to his family, his community, and to society at large. And as long as he was seen that way, his truth was hidden. What was not received was not given. And what struck me about that was it reminded me of God's great loving care for my son. And my suffering and my hardship, it's bumping up against all these like personality things. But that was also the wormhole to the heart of God. And that there is a relationship between Jesus and my son. And G Jesus had a mission and if you open up your heart to Jesus, you will be blessed beyond imagination. And the same is true for every disabled person you've ever met. If you open your heart to them, you will be blessed beyond what you think possible. 
I, I can't say that that was a life-changing trip. Uh, what I would suggest to you is that it was a life-transforming trip. Because uh, as David Brooks has said, your pain that is not transformed is simply transmitted to others. A few months later, uh, we had a lot of EPC pastors on our back porch until about one o'clock in the morning for several nights while we hosted our, our district meeting. And I opened up to some of those pastors about what I was going through, which is also not like me. Uh, personality stuff, remember? And what blew me away, I mean, it genuinely blew me away, was that these guys actually cared. These guys don't stand to gain anything by caring. And what I found was actually, through my suffering, a deeper appreciation for God's love for me and a widening of my life. So that I realized my suffering was not alone. I had a broader network I had more Christians in my back pocket than I thought because I leaned on them. I'm reminded of what David Brooks says about suffering. He wrote this in a, in a book he just wrote. I love this. The right thing to do when you are in moments of suffering is to stand erect in the suffering. Wait. See what it has to teach you. Understand that your suffering is a task that, if handled correctly, with the help of others, will lead to enlargement, not diminishment. Uh, friends, that's the invitation. Uh, not to know why God does what he does <laughs> or why he allows the suffering, but to know how to use hardship and suffering to change your life. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and Lord, we praise and thank you that you speak to us most profoundly in the valley and in the hardship. And so, Father, as I uh, speak on behalf of a whole group of people uh, who are all on their unique sanctification plan, Lord, I pray that we would consider Jesus crucified for us, able to sympathize with our weaknesses, full of compassion, full of understanding. And Father, I pray that we would not give up. Uh, Lord, that we would turn from resentment and self-pity. Lord, that we would not seek to just die in our dread. Uh, but Lord, that we would trust that you are guiding us by your hand. And so Father, as we experience your loving discipline, uh, Father, would we accept it as your love, your chastisement, and Lord, as you chip things away from us, uh, Lord, we ask that you would soften our hard edges. You would chip away all of the things in our lives that are not of you. Lord, you would teach us how to repent from the things that don't matter and how to turn to righteousness, the life that you've called each one of us to live, a life shared with your life and a life spent caring for others. Uh, Father, I pray for the brothers and sisters here who are suffering Lord, I pray that they would have a new experience of your heart. And Lord, that they would take courage this season, talk to other brothers and sisters in Christ, open up about what they're going through. And Lord, would you prove yourself working through us, your people. Father, we pray for those who were baptized this morning, who will be baptized. Uh, Father, would they always have a community of believers around them? And Lord, would their lives be one of enlargement, not diminishment? And Father, we pray for another church here in the Rogue Valley, and we thank you, Lord, that uh, we're not alone, that there are other Christians, uh, even more sufferers than we realize. And Lord, we pray and ask that you would bless the Story Church in Ashland, or that you would be with Pastor Rousseau, Pastor Zav, uh, Lord, that you would bless the work of their hands, and as they go through hardship, uh, Father, would they grow closer to your heart as well. And Lord, lastly, we pray for U715 Ministries, uh, Lord, there are so many teenagers in our valley uh, that are living without hope, that don't know the love of a father. And Lord, we pray that you would use the men and women of U715 to reach those teenagers. And Lord, would they bring teenagers close to your heart. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.